Hi. Um, I'm making this video because I just got done watching what I hope will be the last video on YouTube that I've seen about people complaining about why I quit teaching. And uh, I got to tell you, it really makes my blood boil. I mean, uh, and not, not because I sympathize with them, frankly. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself, uh, where I'm coming from. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for 40 years. I'm an old man, obviously. I'm 67 years old. I've been teaching for 40 years uh, high school in the city of Chicago, okay? So um, what I'm dealing with is uh, so, so many of these videos that I see seem to be coming from, uh, no knock against them, but it seems to be coming from small town America. Uh, a lot of them aren't, okay, granted, but many of them are, you know? And, and small town America's got this vision of Chicago as big bad Chicago, like we're all dodging bullets all the time and all that. Uh, but I've made my career and it's still, I'm still teaching in the city of Chicago. Uh, and everything these people are saying in all these videos, they're, they're, they're complaining about students, they're complaining about parents in particular, they're complaining about administrators, which I kind of understand, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But you know what they're not complaining about? They're all talking about why they quit teaching, right? All these people are talking about, oh, I had to quit teaching. Why? And they're blaming everybody except one person, themselves. There's never, I, I never see any of these videos where they say, hey, you know what, I got into this thing and it just wasn't for me. I mean, uh, I, I kind of miscalculated and maybe this wasn't something that I should have done. So I'm going to go be an accountant or whatever the hell they're going to go be. It's just... They come off as whiny, self-absorbed. The way they make their videos, they all got their little jump cuts and shit. The one guy's talking from his car. And he's going, you know, it's they are affected people. And I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I've been doing this a long time, okay? Um, I am the, the department chair, social studies department chair at a, at a high school in Chicago. And uh, so I've overseen you know, all kinds, dozens and dozens of teachers in my department. I've mentored them. Um, I am, I have a master's degree, a graduate, or uh, excuse me, my bachelor's degree, my graduate degree are both in history. Um, and, you know, frankly, not to pat myself on the back, but just so you know where I'm coming from, um, you know, I, I, I've won all kinds of awards. Uh, last, you know, I, I, I've been chosen as, as the teacher of the year in my school, things like that. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that, but I'm just trying to tell you that I'm not just some schmo off the street who doesn't know what he's talking about. I get, you get these videos with people who wouldn't teach it for three years. Oh, it's not what I thought. Well, how about that? You know, it wasn't what you thought. Why don't you just admit that? You know, so anyway, I'm getting a little upset here. Um, I'll say this. In all of those videos, every video I watched, and they're all so hyper-emotional, and they're putting it in the jump cuts, which I hate, and all that crap. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, it's a good thing they quit teaching. It's a good thing they quit teaching, because frankly, they probably weren't very good teachers. I've seen a lot of teachers in my time that weren't very good teachers, who shouldn't have gone into it. I've mentored, I've had student teachers in my classroom, I, in the 40 years that I've been teaching, I've probably had a full-time student teacher in my classroom at least a third of those years. So, you know, we're looking at, what's a third of 40? Jesus, I, I'm not a math teacher, I'm a history teacher. Um, so I've had all kinds of student teachers as well. And one of the things I'm proudest of is I had to have that difficult conversation with a few of these people. And I said, you know what? Maybe this isn't for you. You know, as someone, someone I knew long ago said, perhaps your ministry lies elsewhere. Um, because it's not easy. And, and I don't know exactly what makes a good teacher. I, I have a general idea what, what doesn't make a good teacher. And a lot of it goes back to why did you go into teaching, right? When I see teachers that struggle with kids, it's usually one of two things. One, they wanted to be the most popular kid in class or they wanted to be some sort of dictator and control all kinds of people. Uh, that's not as common as the first one. Uh, back in the old days, there were a lot more people that went into it because they wanted to boss people around and stuff like that. But now it's people that, that want to be, frankly, they want to be the kid's best friend. 
The kids don't want you to be their best friend. They A 16-year-old wants his best friend to be 16, not 34, you know. Um, one of the problems that we have with all this is our society and even most of our schools. They focus on, they say, you know, they have all these, oh, go in and touch hearts and do that. I'm not going in to touch anybody's heart or anything else. I'm there to teach. My kids are great. I respect them and they respect me, but we're not friends. I don't want to be their friends. I have two sons of my own, right? I love them. I don't love my students. How could I love my students? I only have them for nine months out of the year. I don't love them and I'm not there because I have some bizarre love for children, uh, other people's children. I, I have a normal love for my own children, but I have no strange love for other people's children or hanging out with people that are teenagers, right? And I never did. When I started teaching and I was only a few years older than the kids, I didn't want to be like them. I wanted to be the age that I was. So what ends up happening is if you go in and you're expecting that if you're going to be the hip young teacher that they all love, they're going to reciprocate and they're going to love you right back. That's going to be true for some of them. There's a few of them that, that fall for that kind of stuff and they go into it, whatever. But the vast majority of them are just, they're kids, they're teenagers, they're adolescents. Their job is to rebel. They're hardwired to rebel against authority figures and against their parents and everything else. And that's fine. They're supposed to be that way, right? The thing is, you got to figure out how to deal with that. And you don't deal with that by assuming that they're going to love you and adore you all the time. They're not. They're not going to. And as soon as you turn it into this whole emotional thing, oh, I'm there to touch heart. I'm not there to touch heart. You know what I'm there to touch? I'm there to teach them how important it is to learn about American history and American government. Because we live in a society that's like falling apart at the seams. We're so polarized and everything else. I went into teaching because I felt that probably the most important thing that kids need to know is to know the history of this country, the correct history of this country, and they need to know about society and what it's like and how to function in that society and how to be good citizens. I believe that what I teach, and I teach American history, I teach government, I teach history of Chicago, I teach uh, sociology, I believe those are the most important things being taught in my school, right? That's what I believe. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be doing it, you know? Now, I would hope that the, our math teachers or math teachers around the country think that the, what they're teaching is the most important thing in the school because that's what it's all about. If you have a passion, if you really believe that what you're teaching is essential to these kids, that it's like the most important thing they're ever going to learn, then that becomes the thing that is contagious to them, right? And when you just have this kind of vague, oh, I'm here to touch hearts, kids see right through that. You know, they're looking for those kinds of things. Who can we screw around with? I don't know how many times I've had, I've had teachers that come to me and they say, oh, you know, Billy Jones or Bobby, this kid's been terrible. Aren't they terrible for you? And I'm like, no, that kid's fine in my class. What are you talking about? And it's because when they come into my class... They kind of know, well, this isn't a place where we fuck around. But they go into that other guy's class and they say, okay, can't wait. This is this idiot that thinks I love him and wants me to what It's ridiculous. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. I, I, I remember one time I had a conversation with one of our teachers, this young girl who was one of these touch hearts people, right? And and real quick, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, the I like my kids. I enjoy my kids. Yes, it's important that kids have emotional growth and that you have a connection with them. But it's this idea that the whole reason you're there is to make some sort of friendship or make some... Anyhow, this one teacher, she was very young. She had been teaching a few years and she was already getting her master's degree. She was working on her... And she was already deciding that she was going to get her master's degree in administration. And more about that later. And I said... Really? I, you know, I was just talking to her. I said, oh, so you're, you're working on your graduate work, and uh, so you're going to get it in administration? She goes, yeah, yeah, I am. And I said, oh, well, good for you. I said, I'm just curious, why didn't you get it in English? Because you're an English teacher, right? Didn't you get your undergrad in English? And she said, she said oh, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> you know, English is just what I teach. And I said, what? 
She goes, well, you know, I, I teach English. I don't have any great love for it. She, she says, and I swear to God, I swear to God, she said, it's not like I go home and read books or anything. This was a person who was teaching English. Thank God she wasn't in the school when my kids were there because I would have yanked her out and yanked them out of that class in a, in a heartbeat. You know, yeah, I teach English, but I don't go home and read books or anything. Well, then you shouldn't be a teacher. And so that's another problem that we run into. Many times, not all the time, but many times administrators are simply failed teachers. They're people who go into the classroom, they spend two or three years there, and they're like, Jesus, this isn't for me. What am I going to do? And so they go in and they get their degree in administration, and now they get to sit by a desk and boss people around. They're not all like that. I'll tell you right now that the administration that I have right now at the school I'm at is spectacular. But I've seen it a lot. And you know what? Here's the other thing. No matter what you go into, no matter what area of life you go into, whether it's teaching, construction, buyout, whatever you're going to go into, a lot of bosses are jerks. That's all there is to it. You know what? Deal with it. Deal with it. Half the people in this country are jerks. Deal with them. Right? Don't blame them. It's up to you to figure out how to, how to navigate all that. Hi, okay, I'm back. Uh, sorry, the dog was barking. Um, so, where was I? Um, oh, so here's where I want to go now. A lot of these people that I see in these videos, these te and so, you know, some have been doing it a long time. Some say, oh, I've been teaching for 20 years or 30 years. Okay, fine. But uh, if you've got all these same complaints as somebody who's been teaching for six months, I don't think maybe you've been a real effective teacher. But here's the thing. I really, really get sick and tired of people saying stuff like, especially older people, oh, you know, kids aren't the same anymore. These days, kids are the, these days, they're, kids are the same as they've always been. I started high school 54 years ago. I started high school in 1970. And the kids that I have in my high school right now, you know, obviously they're not identical people, but it's the same thing. You get high achieving kids, low achieving kids. You have kids that have uh, emotional issues. You have kids that don't. You have kids that are 12 years old and act like they're 50. You've got 18 year olds who act like they're six. There's all kinds. There's a whole range. Kids are not that different. They're the same. And to blame kids these days. Okay, you're going to change the whole world's kids. Um, it's not the kids. It's not the kids. They're no different. Um, and also parents. That's the other thing I get tired of. Uh, you know, I hear these stories of people saying, you know, when you call the parents, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, then you must be calling the parents in the wrong way. That's all I can tell you. I, I don't know what to tell you. In 30 years, 40 years, I can think of maybe two parents who weren't behind me 100% when I contacted them. You know, it depends on how you contact them. If you're going to call somebody up and say, hey, your kid was doing this and that and your kid was, the, well, of course they're going to be, but you know, they're, they're going to react against that. I would too. But if you calmly sit down and say, hey, let's work together because I really think that your son or your daughter uh, can, can go places. So here's some things that I think we need to work on. Here's what happened today, for example. Your son or your daughter did this in class today. That can't go. So together, maybe we can work on that. I mean, that, that's all there is to it. Parents, again, are no different, really, than they used to be. They're the same. You know, here's the other thing that I love. All these people complaining about parents. Not only on those videos, but I hear it in every day. They, they, these parents today, parents today, nah, 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 and they're parents. You're a parent today. What do you mean these parents today? Oh, it's everybody but you? You're the only one that's not this? It's ridiculous. People want to blame everything in the world other than themselves, you know, and, and it's just ridiculous. It, if, if, if you got into something that you're not well suited for, fine. Just, you know, admit it. I, I know that if I went into plumbing, I'd be shitty at it. I wouldn't be able to do it. Or if I went into anything math related, I can't do math. So I, I just, th this, this blaming the whole world and everything, that's why you're a bad teacher. If you have that perspective, 
if your world perspective is it's the it's the parents' fault and it's the it's the kids' fault and it's the administration's fault and it's this and that, well then I'm gonna tell you right now, you're probably not a very good teacher. You're probably not me. And here's the other thing: there is an indefinable quality. I don't know what it is. I only know it when I see it. It's kind of like the Supreme Court justice talking about pornography. I, I don't know. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Same thing is true with a teacher. There are certain teachers that just have the personality where it works. Where when they speak to groups of people, especially kids, the kids kind of get it. They're not angry. They're not begging for affection. They're just talking to people. And they're not doing it. You know, I get a lot of teachers. I walk past the room and I hear them. All right, students, today we're going to, you know, they change everything. It's like, just God, relax. Just talk to people the way that you would normally talk to people. And understand along the way that there's going to be kids that are going to act out. How are you going to deal with it? Deal with it like an adult. Wait until the class is over and then pull the kid in and say, hey, man, you can't do that, you know? And if you do, if it happens again, you know, I'm going to contact your folks and maybe you're going to get a detention or something. So come on. It's, it's the way that certain people, I, I, we, I, I've worked with teachers who can't even look you in the eye. You know, you walk by and you say hi in the hall and they go, mm -hmm. and they looked at, and it's like, well, what the, who told you that you had any sort of charisma to be a teacher? At no point did somebody stop and say, hey, you know what, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you need a job where you're in a cubicle somewhere, you know? So, I don't know. I, I know I'm ranting and I'm going on and on and on. Um, uh, parents are fine. Kids are fine. The world is generally much better place than it used to be. It really is. It's a safer place. And while I'm here, I'll throw that in. Oh, this not all oh, these days. You know, I'm a social scientist. And I'll tell you right now, at least for where I live and for almost every city in the country, the murder rates and the crime rates are dramatically less than they were when you were growing up. In the 1970s and 80s and 90s, the murder rates here in Chicago were double what they are now, you know. And, and this idea that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, that's not true. You know what's going to hell in a handbasket? You are. You are. Because you're getting older and your perspective is changing. And when you're young, you're innocent and you don't know about all of the awful things that go on in life. And then when you become an adult, you kind of see these things. You're not shielded from them anymore. And so now people think, oh, look, the world's such a terrible place. Jesus Christ, have a little metacognition. Step outside yourself and turn around and look at yourself and figure out why it seems that way. Maybe it's you. You know, I don't see the world at age 67 the way that I did when I was 17. Of course not. It's a completely different thing because I have changed. Okay. Uh, so I guess that's about it. I just, you know, there's plenty of great teachers out there. And guess what? They didn't quit and they didn't blame students and they didn't blame uh, administrators and they didn't blame uh, parents. And they, it's ridiculous. Um one thing I'll say, I'll, I'll close with this, and, and that is, if there is one thing that has changed, um, I will accept the fact that there are, and, and I think some of the people may have said this in their videos, thank God I don't teach in a place like Florida, right? Where, where, where they have these people that are not historians telling historians what they, what they have to teach. You know, and, and all that reactionary crap from the governor in Florida and other states. Uh, I, I, I'm in Illinois and in Illinois and in Chicago. Uh, we, we, it's, it's weird. When it comes to history, we base it on, oh, what historians have discovered about history. That, that's kind of the way we do it. Rather than what some businessman or some banker decided that history should be. So, uh, I do get it when, at like English teachers that are saying, you know, I'm out of here because I can't teach To Kill a Mockingbird anymore, or you know, I can't teach W. E. B. Du Bois because of they 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 come up with all this nonsense. You know, the 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 school boards who don't even know what critical race theory is, and they're throwing everything. In. So people that are victims of that, I get it. 
You know, if I were you, I'd probably quit teaching too. If somebody came down to me and said, you know, hey, you can't teach this. You get, give me this history book that's got real history in it. You can't teach that anymore. I, I'd probably leave too. But thankfully, uh, I have a great administration. So um, I guess that's all I have to say. I just wanted to get this off my chest. I'm sick and tired of a lot of these videos I see. And I know, you know, there's going to be people that are going to rip the shit out of me in the comments. And go right ahead. What do I care? I don't know who you are. So um, if you do recognize me, if you're one of my former students, good for you. I hope you're doing well. Um, if you're one of the teachers that I know that were shitty teachers when you worked with me, well, you know, deal with it. Um, but I work with plenty of good teachers. You know, there's plenty of people out there that uh, that are doing what they should be doing. And I, I suppose one last thing. Another thing that's probably changed is, yeah, I think there is, there are fewer people going into teaching, obviously, right? So because there is uh, a dramatically fewer people, I mean, in some universities, they're like thinking about shutting down their education departments um, because teacher pay is bad. You know, teacher pay is low. Uh, and it varies all around the all around the country, um, and teachers should be paid a lot more. But uh, same thing, cops should be paid more. But they should have a lot more education, right? Whether it's teachers or cops or whatever, uh, yeah, get, get give them more money, but have them better educated and have them better trained. Now these days, the number of the the pool of available teachers it's unbelievable. We used to have. When we had an opening in my department, we had to hire somebody. There might be, you know, 10, 20, 30 people. I know in, in some schools out in the suburbs, they'd have 400 people apply for one job. You know, now we put a job opening and we get maybe one applicant and, and or two. Sometimes we get none. So now you're kind of really searching for people. And as a result of that, I think that's been a big problem in education is the quality of teachers is dramatically less because the pool of available candidates is dramatically less. And so there's going to be fewer and fewer people that are, you know, you're less and less likely to find somebody that's going to be able to do a good job. So, all right, I'm done. I'm, ra I'm done ranting. Um, I got some notes here. Let me just make sure there's nothing else that, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 if you're just going into teaching and you're reading some of these things, um, you know, two things. One, especially if you're going to go into high school, get your graduate degree in the area, not in education. Those, those degrees aren't, aren't really worth anything. The, what really makes you a good teacher in the classroom, I firmly believe, is that you know more than what's in that 11th grade textbook. You know, you should be whatever it is, whether it's math, whether it's literature, whether it's history like I teach, whether it's art, you should be bringing in other materials that you are, because you're the expert, and you're not just some guy who can go from chapter to chapter and figure out what's coming next for the 11th graders, but you should have a, a real wide range of knowledge in what you're teaching. You should think of yourself as a college teacher. Um, I work as an adjunct professor at a university because we have a program in our school where the kids get college credit for, uh, for, for the highest achievement uh, courses that we offer. And so I teach those courses. So um, I think that's one thing. Get your, get your graduate degree in the area that you're teaching. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, uh, because frankly, I learned more in my graduate work in history than all my other education combined. The, um, the second thing that I was going to mention is uh, people talked about how difficult it was with phones, that the kids had, have their phones out and that that's changed. Obviously, that is. That's something that's new. Um, and, and, and really, that just kind of started with this iPad crap, um, which I've opposed from the very beginning. Uh, we, we were one of the first schools in the state of Illinois to go all iPad for a while there. We got rid of our textbooks, which... Uh, it, to our credit, we realized was a mistake. Um, we still have the iPads, um, but uh, we also still, we've gone back to, to textbooks as well. Uh, I don't really use the iPads in my classroom. Unfortunate, I have that prerogative. Uh, my administration does not make me use an iPad. 
Um, they're there, and I use my computer a lot, and we do stuff online. It's not like I'm a, um, you know, it's not like I'm a Luddite that doesn't believe in, in technology. It's just ridiculous, though, to, to, to hand over to kids, okay, here's this machine where you can play all the games in the world. Now, pay attention to me while you're... It's ridiculous. So, um... Uh, we uh, really curb our iPads are kind of locked and all that, so the kids can't do too much on them. But I just tell the kids at the beginning, they walk in my room and they know. It is a rule from day one that the moment they walk into my classroom, their iPad goes underneath their desk and they do not take it out until or unless I tell them to, which is extremely rare. Uh, it's uh, Thanksgiving now, and I think I've asked them to take out their iPads once. And that was just to register for the college credit for the course. Um, uh, and by the way, real quick to throw this in. Yes, I do teach high-achieving kids right now. But throughout my career, I've taught all levels of kids. I've taught freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. I've taught the lowest achieving kids who have the most executive fun functioning issues, things like that, kids with uh, IEPs and 504 plans. And I also teach the college level class so, and, and everything in between. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so, so if you can get, get away without using that iPad, it's great. Phones, uh, I, I always had a, a no-tolerance policy on phones. Again, that if the phone ever came out, I confiscated it. That was the rule that, and I think a lot of schools have that. You just say, hey, you know, you got to leave that up here. And then you give it to the dean at the end of the class, and then mom and dad have to come in and pick it up. For a while, we had a fine for it, but I don't, I don't think... Uh, I don't know if we have a fine anymore because what we did is as faculty, uh, we made, uh, we got together and talked a lot. And this is to the credit of our administration. Um, we've just been terrific. We said, you know, there are schools where the kids have to leave their iPhone, leave their phones in their lockers. Can we do that? And we talked about it, went through it for months, actually a couple of years. And we've gone to that. So the kids technically have to leave their phones in their lockers from the beginning of first period until the end of the day and then they can go get them this idea about oh well, how am i going to get a hold of my kid what if there's an emergency first of all if there's an emergency you don't call the kid you would call the school right the school office and you know I, that whole thing oh they have to have their phones or or they can't communicate with their how did how did parents ever communicate with people for a thousand years in western culture without a phone how were they able to do that where their kids went to school and they could immediately access so it's nonsense it's worked out great so in our school the kids have to have their their phones in their lockers and um there are many of them who still keep them in their pockets. You can tell, you see that rectangle. And I'm not going to go reach for anybody's rectangle. Um, but they do know that by keeping it in their pocket, they are breaking the rule just by having it. So it's extremely rare. It took a while, took a few weeks, maybe a month. But we got to the point where phones are no longer an issue in our school. So... Um, the, the kids really don't use them at all during the school day. What they end up doing is they go to the bathroom more often, and now they're using their phone in the bathroom. But uh, the trade-off isn't too bad. So I, if you're a teacher and you're watching this, uh, you know, I think it, it worked at our place. You know, we, we, we lobbied administration. We talked about it all the time. We had all kinds of meetings. And we talked to the dean's office and, and all the deans and everything, and, and it's worked out great. So... Um, just wanted to throw that in. That, yes, has changed, uh, you know, the, 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 the phones and, 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 the, and the tablets and all that kind of stuff. So. I guess that's about it. I mean, just, you know, get your graduate degree in whatever it is uh, that you're teaching uh, and, and, and think about the role of teacher as someone who is the expert in the field. And so... Now, with compassion and respect, if you respect the kids, you don't have to love them, you just respect them, and the vast majority of people in this world will turn around and show you respect. And, and if you're 30 years old and you don't think that's true, well then I don't, I don't know, what to, I don't know what to, how to help you. Um, 
I've lived a pretty long life, and, and, and I think it's true. There's a lot of people that are jerks in this world, but if you treat them with respect, they tend to treat you with respect. Uh, and especially kids. Kids are, you know, it's so rare that I've had a kid that was unmanageable. It, it's happened, but it's rare. And I think if you just realize that there's a reason that that kid is unmanageable. You know, the, the, the people come to you, they've got all kinds of background that you know nothing about, you know. So, um, yeah, so I guess that's it. I'm done ranting, so go ahead and rip me in the in the in the uh, in the comments if anybody even watches this. I'll probably get about four views on this, so it won't matter anyway. But I'm done. That's it. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.